We all turned up, guys? Awesome. Good morning, everyone. I'm John, and I am delighted that you are here to worship with us this morning. Just continue to uh, relax and uh, settle in as, as we uh, prepare our hearts for this time of worship. I want you to, to just think about the stuff that you are bringing here today. The, the, maybe the concerns that you uh, are weighed down with from what's happening in your personal life. Maybe there's, maybe there's a health issue that you yourself are dealing with. Maybe school is uh, not going the way that you hoped it would go. Uh, maybe, maybe you have a relationship that ended recently and your heart is broken, connect with or relate to God. Anybody feel that way ever? Come on, be honest with me. Man, well, one of the things that we've been commanded in the scripture is uh, to fix our eyes on what is unseen. Now, I know I talk about this a lot, and you guys probably think I'm weird because I talk about fixing your eyes on what is unseen. But this is the spiritual life, fixing our eyes on what is not seen. For what is seen, what's immediately visible to you, all of the circumstances of your life, what is seen is temporal. But what is unseen is eternal. And so when we do this fixing of our eyes on the eternal, man, it takes a, it, it, there's got to be a flip in the way that we're looking, in what we're looking at and what we're seeing. It's got to be beyond the circumstances to the eternal. And, and, and here's the news. The eternal one is the Lord Jesus himself who, who existed before the foundation of time, who, who came in the form of an infant baby, who died on a cruel cross and who burst forth back to life three days later and has ascended to, seat, to sit at the right hand of the Father. He is the eternal one. He is our focus. He is the one that we worship. And so oh, we, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And in doing so, we gain the perspective that we need to worship, even when there's that fog and the circumstances and the stuff that's swirling around us. So I invite you to do that, to fix your eyes on Jesus and to worship him and him alone and, and to let him be the focus. So don't think about what's going on around you. Don't Worry about what other people are thinking about the way that you're worshiping or not worshiping or whether you're moving or not moving, whether you're clapping or not clapping, dancing or not dancing, smiling.
You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. You are. have passed away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the cornerstone thank you and things that we thought
Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. No, let's empty praise the treasures of faith. Never enough. All right, y'all came ready, huh? So you came along and you put me back together.
said dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory Come on! You're the praise you this morning. We lift you up. We glorify your name and not ourselves this morning. Set us aside. God, let the praises of your people become a throne for you this morning, a beautiful, ornate throne. We don't belong in that place, God. Help us to remember to love others first today, to seek not to be heard first, but to understand to be your hands and feet this morning. Help us to put away selfishness and vain conceit. And when we turn our eyes on you, God, just ask that you give us peace. Give us wisdom to go about today. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. All right, if you are new here this morning, what we do is we take a 10-minute break right now. There's a walk across the room. Get to know some people. If you are conscious of COVID, just let somebody know. If you don't, you know, if you want some distance, please just, you know, be respectful of each other this morning. On top of that, there's coffee in the back. We'll be back in 10 minutes, all right? See you soon.
vacation. Oh, testing. I had a great vacation. All right, everybody. If you would find your way to your seats, we would appreciate it. Isn't it great to be back? Oh, a little enthusiasm there. That's good. That's good. Well, we're glad to be back, and we appreciate your accommodating us through all of our changes as we try to uh, maintain our sense of community and connectedness, but at the same time show uh, responsibility and uh, concern for the community we live in. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to go over a few announcements, and of course, since we have been sort of in a period of transition trying to adjust to things, if there's any information you see that's not up to date, I'm going to try to update it for you. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for all of your giving. Um, and you know, it's interesting, I was thinking about this this morning. It's one thing to realize that your giving helps keep the lights on, helps keep us in couches and tables and all the things we like about Mosaic, right? But if you go to the bathroom and you see on that wall all of the missionaries all around the world that are doing things, you're helping them too. And some of them don't have couches. They don't have coffee or a coffee break. They're dealing with a lot of challenges. In fact, just this weekend, we learned that our missionaries down in Guatemala have lost the facility where they were doing a lot of teaching and training for the local community because of a misunderstanding with the landlord. They have to be out by the end of the month, and they don't know where they're going to go. But these kinds of things happen to them all the time, and the last thing they need to worry about is where their resources are coming from, and so you're helping them with that, and I appreciate that. So continue to give as you always have and give generously. We're not asking you to do anything that isn't coming from the generosity of your own heart. And Wit's back there putting his in the mailbox, so thank you for that timely example. <laughs> and of course, you can give online. We have Venmo. We have the Church Center app, which if you haven't downloaded it yet, it's a source of great information, so please do that. Or you can give online at our website at mosaicva.com. So thank you for that. And speaking of that app, the Church Center app, of course, not only has a giving module, but it has other information as well. In fact, I used it this weekend to do a directory check. And so it's a good use, a good use of resources there. And we encourage you to download it. You can have it on your Apple through the App Store or Google Play. So no one has an excuse. And if you're not getting our emails, um, this past week was a good example where we were notifying everyone that we were back to, uh, having in-person services. But if you're not on the email list, you didn't see it. So we encourage you to go to the website and sign up for the emails. That way you're aware of everything that's going on. And if you've got friends who want to know what's going on here at Mosaic and they want to check us out, have them sign up too. We're happy to send information to anyone who is interested. The gathering. The gathering is back now. It says September 23rd, so mark that date right here, 6.30 at Mosaic. So we hope that you will plan to be there, and we're glad that we're able to have the facility for the gathering. Uh, they always have a wonderful time of food and fellowship, so we encourage all the women of the church to join us for the gathering. And talent and testimony. We were unable to have it this past time because of everything that happened, but we're back, and not only are we back, I have new cards here for that giant gourmet cookie. Remember, everybody was salivating over that cookie, and they couldn't get one because we didn't have it in the beginning of September. Well, October 1st, and it's going to be the first Friday of every month going forward. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a ministry under the banner of the No Walls Ministry, which is involved in community service, relationship building, and education to bring down the barriers that separate us and bring us together in unity. So these cards, it says redeemed this card for a free cookie, one coupon per person. However, I have a ton of them. So <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful that everybody will come and I have to tell uh, Lori and crew from Lavished Bake Shop, get your ovens fired up because there's gonna be a lot of people and a lot of cookies. 
So we're looking forward. Um, we're also still looking for talent. Talent. <laughs> Yes, Carlson right here. He's our talent scout. All right. Think of him like you're doing an audition for American Idol. That's the guy you need to see. All right. <laughs> hey, you can do a good Simon Cowell, I'm sure. <laughs> so just check with Carlton because and the, and the talents are limitless. When we talk about the arts, it could be singing. It could be spoken word. It could be poetry. It could be painting. We've had people with various instru instruments. We've had jugglers. We've had acrobats. Uh, seriously, we have. So it, it was very interesting to watch them navigate the small area right here. So please, uh, see Carlton, or if you know someone that has a talent. And note, it's talent and testimony, because everyone who comes to show their talent gives a testimony about what God has done in their lives. We had a musician one time who spoke about how he battled with drug addiction and through his music and everything else he did he now has a home over in Madison Heights for people who are trying to recover from drug addiction he and his father run it so that's a great testimony so we encourage you to do that October 1st starts at 7 o'clock so right here in this building so we mentioned in our email that we wanted to take every precaution to be good citizens in our community and so I wanted to invite up someone who's a member of our mosaic family but who also is a nurse at Centra to give us kind of her update and her heart about what it is she's doing so if Lisa Miller would come on up thanks y'all um, <laughs> For those of y'all that don't know me, I'm Lisa. I've been going here for about a year, and that was when I started working at Centra. I started on an oncology floor and ended up working COVID for about three months during the winter, and now because of another spike, i um, been doing COVID again the last little over a month. Um, so Ron just wanted me to share a little bit about like the current state of the hospital and everything and also a little bit about my I guess testimony working with it um, basically about a little over a third of the hospital at Lynchburg General is just full of COVID patients um, the ICUs they've had to like turn another ICU into a COVID ICU right now the fifth floor which is the pulmonary floor that was where all the COVID was that's all COVID, fourth floor is COVID, third floor is COVID, and even part of the second floor is COVID, which wasn't even the case in January when it was the worst. Um, staffing's been a lot worse because a lot of nurses are were burnt out from the last wave of COVID and have since left. So those of us that are left are <laughs> still kicking. Um, but it's been also a different experience, different demographic this time around too. Uh, the first time was a lot of older people from nursing homes or 65 and older, all these medical problems. And now we're seeing instead a lot of middle-aged, unvaccinated, and some vaccinated from nursing homes. It's been consistently about 10% um, fully vaccinated and the rest not. Um, that number, the vaccinated percentage has gone up a little bit recently because there have been a couple outbreaks at nursing homes, so we get a lot of those patients. But my experience, it's just been, it was rough the first time, but it's been heartbreaking to see previously young, healthy people that are so sick and dying and knowing that they could have been vaccinated and this could have not been the case is is heartbreaking. Um, so anyway, I just want to share all of this to say, like, God has been so good, <laughs> for one thing. There is so much hope. Um, and I firmly believe that God has me exactly where I'm supposed to be at this time. 
and it's been an amazing privilege kind of like working in a closed country because like no one else can go in there but I can um but at the same time it's heavy because you never know like how long someone has left you never know if you're the last interaction that they're going to have with a believer and you just try to be faithful and listen to the holy spirit so i ask for your prayers for for me for boldness in that i ask for your prayers for my coworkers, a lot of whom are i don't know how they do it without the lord because i don't know how i would do it without the lord <laughs> um but prayers for them especially for those working in the icu because statistically they lose about half of their patients and that's really tough to do day in and day out. Um, I also would share this to say, just like be informed about what's going on. A lot of people just turn off the news and then COVID doesn't exist to them anymore, but I don't have that privilege because I have to go to work. Um, <laughs> so COVID can't go away for me. So I would just ask that y'all make decisions about vaccination, masks, get-togethers that you have with families and friends just based on being informed about what's happening in our community and um, praying for, for wisdom as far as that God would lead you to, to make the right decisions about those things. Um, and what's right for you is probably different than what's right for me, so I'm not here to judge or um, say that there's only one right thing to do, but I would say to just be aware of what's going on and make decisions based on that and keep praying for us and um, have that same perspective too that I've gained from being around death and being close to that. And you never know as well who you're gonna be around that they, you might be the, the last Christian that they interact with. You never know how long life is and um, yeah, just remembering that and listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, I also want to make myself available as a resource to y'all. Um, you can ask me any questions about COVID, whatever, about my experience. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, and if y'all end up with COVID or know someone that has it and are concerned about them, I'm happy to talk to them or drop in and visit them. I work around COVID all the time, so I can take the precautions. It's no different for me going to see your friend or family member than it is going in um, the hospital room. So I just wanted to make myself available to y'all and thank you for your prayers. Thank you so much for your support. I've gotten many texts from people on the prayer team and others of y'all that have just been so encouraging checking in on me. And I appreciate that and God's really like renewed the joy and the passion that I have for what I do. And I completely credit him and how he's used y'all as well. So thank you. Last week um, when we were live streaming and we had the mosaic mingle prior to the service, uh, Lisa had shared a story about how a husband and a wife that she had cared for on her floor uh, went up to the ICU and that they had died within hours of each other. And I could tell she was burdened by it, so we prayed for her then. And that's when I felt like it was really important for us to hear her perspective because we can get lost in all of the things that we see in society and the news and social media, but as Christians, I just believe compassion ought to be the overriding thing, you know. Um, we've got some people that aren't here today that I know are, are at home uh, battling COVID right now, some of them pretty seriously. Um, Rick, uh, we met our lead pastor for all those years, let me know that a person that he had brought on to the leadership team for Mosaic back when he first started, uh, a mother with a six-year-old daughter, uh, had passed away. And uh, so we hear these stories, and I just don't want our hearts to get hardened or for our, our, us to get cold about it or cruel. So we need to be compassionate because if we, if we as Christians aren't compassionate, who, who in this world is going to be? So I just wanted her to have an opportunity to share that story. And I have to say, any of you who've known me for a long time know that I have a special relationship with the medical community. Um, <laughs> 
And I have, um, the doctors are incredible, their skill, their knowledge, and all of that. But I got to tell you that during those times when I was broken and humiliated because I couldn't do anything for myself and other people had to do things for me, the people that I really, really loved were the nurses because they just cared for you without complaint, without question. And I'd be there just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you have to care for me. I'm sorry I have to do this. And they said, oh, no, this is what we do. This is why we're here. I think it takes a special heart to be a nurse. So, Lisa, thank you so much. So we give that message to you out of prudence and out of a desire to be good citizens in the community. But there's another message, too, that I think is important Prudence doesn't mean fear. And Julie came to us and said that God had given her a message about fear. So I want to give her an opportunity to share the scriptures that came to her. And then I just want to take us into prayer and into the message today. So Julie. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Um, Jesus, I, I didn't have a chance to look up how many times, but Jesus said over and over and over again to his disciples and the people that he spoke to, fear not, be not afraid, don't be afraid. And... Um, and he didn't get sick. He touched the leper and healed him. And all, oh, you know, so many, so many. And I dropped my Bible on the way up here. So, <laughs> um, besides um, looking up, I c encourage you to look up how many times Jesus said, "Be not afraid," or "Fear not." And the other scripture that's on my heart is Luke 11, 11. Um, well, actually, it starts at 9. Um, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead? Or if he asks for an egg, Will he offer him a scorpion? And the implication is, of course not. And it continues, if you then, being evil or sinful people, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And... Um, Let's see. In the Mark five thirty six and Luke eight fifty, it's the story of Jesus, and um, he was asked to go heal Jairus's daughter, and uh, he overheard all the people that were mourning and, and so on. And he said to the father, do not fear, only believe. And I encourage you to hang on to Jesus and his promises and his word because that's the solid rock on which we can stand. And he loves you, all of you, he loves you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
so be prudent, but fear not. And if you remember back in the days of the Roman Empire, when plague swept the city of Rome, who was there, regardless of their own circumstances, to care for people who were thrown out of their homes, thrown into the street? It was the Christians who were there. And, you know, it's interesting to note that the Roman Empire fell to Christianity without a shot being fired. It was the compassion and the love that they showed to people when they weren't getting it from anywhere else that made that happen. So let's, let's be that example here in our community. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you first and foremost for placing us in this city, in this place at this time. Lord, you say in the book of Acts that you have appointed our location and the times that we're in. So, Lord, help us to accomplish what it is you would have us do in the time and the place that you have given to us. Help us to be a beacon of light. Help us to be an endless well of compassion. Help us to be an endless reservoir of grace. In a culture that so often has no concept of what those things even mean. Lord, I pray for Lisa and others in the health professions who are facing just horrendous things on a daily basis, but Lord, they keep striving, they keep working, and for those who know you, Lord, they keep turning to you, and you keep providing them, you keep replenishing them, Lord. We pray that you would continue to do that. And Lord, we pray that in all of this, that we be mindful of everything, that we be prudent that we be discerning, Lord, but Lord, help us not to fear. For Lord, even if things come to a point where we are to be with you, Lord, that's joy. But Lord, help us to be compassionate for those who are still here with us, whether they are ill or whether they are families dealing with others who are ill. Help us to help them find comfort and peace that only you can give. We thank you, Lord. We love you, and we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your patience. I just wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to really, you know, they talk about the elephant in the room. That's one of our values. Well, obviously, that's the elephant in the city right now. We're going through quite a bit, and I just want to be sure that we don't shy away from it, but that we give the right perspective on it. So thank you for that. And, of course, the Holy Spirit was present because not only... Did Julie have this message for us, but dovetails so nicely into what Jeff Nitz, our speaker this morning, is going to be talking about, about taking courage in the midst of trial and adversity. So, Jeff, please come up. Good morning, Mosaic. All right. And I think I can take this off now, right? All right. Here we go. <laughs> All right, I got a juggling act for you. Lots of good things coming for you. Just teasing, not juggling at all today. All right, I appreciate the fact that you've been praying for the elders as we've been trying to sort this out. Um, it has not been easy to try to figure out what is the prudent and unafraid sort of response that we ought to take here as, as these numbers have increased. Um, and so please keep praying for us. We want to be wise. We want to make sure we're protective. Um, but that also means that we don't want to put people in a situation where, they, where you're not able to gather together because we recognize how important it is to do exactly what we're doing right now. Um, so please be, continue to pray for us. We're going to continue on with our uh, study of Acts. And, uh, and just as a reminder, why are we studying Acts? Um, in, in, in many respects, that's because we have been... Uh, as we were in this journey and transition as a church, we thought, let's go and look and see what uh, the early church did. When the church first started, which is Acts, um, uh, we wanted to see what, is, what did God have to say and it, that's at that time. What did the early church do? What can we take as lessons that how that might apply to us? Because we want to be a church that is absolutely committed to the word, that is absolutely fixed on, on Christ, we want to make sure we're, an, we're a dynamic church here at Mosaic and doing what God has called us to do, our special place in God's bigger picture of this world. And so we've been looking at that and saying, what is, what is there in each of these stories? And as you remember, the first 12 chapters are almost all about Peter. 
The Holy Spirit comes in the second chapter, and then there's a lot of stories about Peter. Uh, there's Philip thrown in there for good measure, and we're watching the disciples slowly evangelize Jerusalem and out into Samaria. Um, and, and, then, and then Peter has this interesting connection with Cornelius, this Roman dude, and he finds out that, oh my goodness, maybe the gospel isn't just for Jewish people. Maybe it's for Gentiles, like probably most of you and me. Um, and so that kind of raises this, whoa, wait a minute, what is this about? I thought everybody had to become Jewish first, and that was the only way you could be saved. What is this about? And then all of a sudden, uh, Peter ent uh, takes off uh, stage left, and in comes Paul. We meet Paul first in chapter 8, um, and he was the one who was right by where Stephen was being stoned, as you remember. And then 9, we get more of that story about what happens to him in his conversion. And then we have a series of, of uh, missionary journeys. We watch Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, spending time evangelizing Jews and Gentiles alike as they go first into Asia, which is modern-day Turkey, and they go a little bit further the next time and go around into, into Greece and Macedonia. And then the third one is what we just finished in chapter 21. Today we're going to chat, go into chapter 22 and 23 because last time uh, we weren't all feeling good and uh, we were struggling with some health issues and so we're going to cover two chapters in one Sunday. You ready? This is going to be a lot. Here we go. Two of them and here we go. And I, I, uh, uh, we call this taking courage because, well, you'll just have to see. Um, so Paul has wrapped up his third missionary journey. He just came back from Greece um, in the previous chapter, and he felt compelled by the Spirit to go back to Jerusalem. He's been to Jerusalem before. He's had some kind of knockout, dragout sometimes with, with the other apostles, and they're on the same page. They're doing some things. But he felt compelled to do that. And were his buddies all excited about that? No. They were saying, don't go, Paul. We know what you're going to find back there. There's going to be people who want to take your life. It's not good. He even had a prophet named Agabus come up to him and say... If you do this, Paul, it's going to be your undoing. Don't do it. But Paul, being faithful to the Holy Spirit, who has put this on his heart, says, nope, I'm going to Jerusalem. May God be with me. And so he gets to Jerusalem and has a conversation with the, uh, with the uh, other apostles, um, and they say, Paul, we're so excited. We're so excited to hear what you're doing with the Jews and the Gentiles. That's so exciting. Um, but let's make sure you're not creating undue challenge for us here in Jerusalem, right? The kind of headquarters of, of uh, Judaism. So we're going to ask you to do this right, uh, pur purity right thing uh, and take a vow and do all these things. And so let, we're kind of diminishing how much um, you're going to annoy and frustrate the Jewish leaders. That's happened in chapter 21. And there were rumors about him at that time, and some of the Jewish people that were over in those areas where he had been preaching um, in Asia and in Greece were there in Jerusalem, and they said, there's that guy, and they were none too happy, and right there in the temple courts, they start beating him with the intent to kill him, right? So think about a guy with a whole bunch of people around him going like this and this, and right, doing everything they can to put him out um, and be done with him. Roman guy comes inside, they pull him aside and say, all right, uh, let's, let's try to figure out what's happening. Instead of putting those mob people in prison, right? No, they pull Paul off and put him in chains. And that's about where we're at. How's that? That's about 21 chapters in, in three and a half minutes. Okay. All right. And so you're thinking, can he do that with two chapters? Nope. <laughs> we got more for you. All right. So... Um, and this is my little clicker, and I'm going to turn it on. I actually brought it up. Um, and so um, the commander says, aren't you that Egyptian guy who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists? This is uh, chapter 21, verses 38. Paul answered, I'm a Jew and from Tarsus. I'm not an Egyptian. I'm a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Uh, having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd when they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic. So that's where we're at. That's where we're at leading up to this uh, passage here. So let's look and see what Paul does. And specifically, I want you to watch. Um, and it's, there we go. One, two, three. What I want you to see is how Paul engages unbelievers at the outset. 
It says this, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. And you just want to go on and say, okay, what a, listen how he, he responded to these folks that, that uh, were unbelievers. He spoke their language. They weren't expecting that. They didn't know who this guy was. Maybe he's going to be Greek. Maybe he's Egyptian. He didn't know how he was, but he spoke their language in Aramaic, the one that they could understand. When you're going to speak to people that are unbelievers, know their language. And you think, well, I'm talking Spanish, French, Arabic, whatever. No, no, know their language. What matters to them? One's language is so much more important than just the words, right? Any particular language, English, French, etc. But it's, it, it's the values, it's the customs, it's knowing what's really most important to that people. Going in with a mindset of humility, understanding their language. What's important to this? Even nonverbals, right? Matter. Knowing when you're speaking to somebody that you're seeking to win over to Christ, know their language. It continues on. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and fall, throwing them into prison. And also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. What's he saying here? He joins with them. Right? Right away, he says, I can understand what your life, why, why you look at, and why you'd be so upset with me. Let me tell you a little, that's exactly what I was doing. I did all these things too. I was persecuting, I was making sure I was right there. Man, I was, I was none too pleased. I was doing everything to put these people in prison. I get it, guys. I understand your experience. I get it. Joining with somebody is a good thing to do, right? When I'm talking with somebody who doesn't understand me, first of all, I've got to figure out who they're about. I've got to know what they're about, talk their language, really understand what they're about, their values. And I join with them where I can join with them. I don't make up something that's inauthentic or not genuine, but I join with them where I can. And I say, I can understand that, right? My wife and I often talk about when, we, when you knew everything there is to know about the other person, if you knew everything, what they're doing would make sense. It's not necessarily right, but it would make sense if you'd lived all of their life. It would make sense why they're doing what they're doing. So how can I join with the person in front of me? And then he goes on with this. And frankly, he, just, he shares how Jesus met him and rocked his world. Um, about noon, as I came to, uh, to be near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. You know the story. And Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul doesn't know who this is. Who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The last time I talked about this in, in chapter 9, I thought, how cool is it that Jesus is saying, why are you persecuting me? Right? Why, is, why would Jesus do that? Because of this incredible solidarity, this union that he has with us as his followers. So that when somebody, one of us gets persecuted, it's Jesus that's getting persecuted. That's pretty powerful. Jesus is saying, Paul, you're persecuting me. What shall I do, Lord, he asked, says Paul. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you'll be told all you've been assigned to do. And the rest of the story pretty much follows what we already follow, or, uh, uh, discussed in chapter, for chapter 9. It's pretty much the same story. But what's interesting here is that, is that Paul isn't saying to these people, right, after he speaks their language, and after he uh, joins with them, he doesn't say, you guys are a bunch of knuckleheads. Let me tell you how. He doesn't say, let me take you through all the scriptures and point through Zechariah and the Psalms, and let me take you to Isaiah 53. Come on, guys, who else could that be talking about? He doesn't go through all those, you know, he doesn't go, doesn't do that. After he shares, after he starts speaking their language, he says, let me tell you, how Jesus rocked my world. In fact, it says he actually, he knocked me on my butt. That's what it says there, right? He says, I, I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, I was down and out. Jesus put me down. Really rocked my world. And that's where he describes. He doesn't, he doesn't berate them. He doesn't convince them. 
He simply shares, this is what happened to me. Jesus met me on the road, and my life has not been the same since. He goes on to say, when Ananias came to him, he says, the God of our fathers, this is verse 14, has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard, and now what you are waiting for. And now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And that's exactly what he did. We hear more about it that in, in Acts chapter 9. So he, he shares all that information. So I think that there might be a pattern of sort, not a formula, but a pattern for us to be mindful as we're sharing our faith with other people. Again, not necessarily trying to convince people that our way, yeah, we, we, we have good reasons. We have rational beliefs, reasons to believe what we believe as, as, as Christians, as Christ followers. We have scripture to back that up. But more than anything, our testimony, talent and testimony, is about how Jesus has affected me how Jesus has come in and changed my life. That's the most potent testimony there is, especially for a world that doesn't believe that the the Bible really has anything to do. I mean, most people anymore in a post-Christian world, and we'll talk about that a little bit, Bible schmeibel, I don't care if you point to a verse and say, well, that's what it says. I don't believe that in the first place. There has to be something, Frank. I mean, not to say, this is God's word, okay? Let's be clear about that. It is the Bible. It is God's word. But in this day and age, it is becoming less relevant. And so there has to be something else sometimes. And we see Paul's pattern here of what he did as he reached out to these folks. And then we come across this passage where, Jesus, where Paul is sharing with, with them that he, he was in the temple and he was praying. And it says, it says he was praying um, and I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. And Jesus said, quick. He said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. I wondered about that. You know, this obviously he was in a deep meditation. It says he was in a trance. I don't know exactly what that means, but he was, he was meditating deeply. And I think something that we forget about um, is as a discipline within the Christian faith is this notion of listening prayer of deep meditation. So some of us may spend a little bit of time reading the Bible. We may listen to something, a podcast or whatever, on our way to work or, you know, while we're at home. But how often do we practice the art of listening prayer? This, this time where you just quiet your heart and listen to what God has to say to you. Let me read a little bit from what I, what I was uh, able to, to discover, and I, this has been true to me. When I make time to really listen, it says, The act or discipline of listening prayer involves quieting one's soul before the Lord, allowing your mental imagery to focus on being present with any member of our triune God. As, tr- as distracting thoughts come up, hand those over prayerfully to the Lord and resume your soul quieting. For some, meditation on a Bible verse that resonates with you is useful in quieting your heart and focusing. Listen to your breathing can help you as well. Asking for God to speak to you from his heart to your heart is useful as well. What is it that I need to hear from you today? Sometimes it's returning to a key point in a sermon or a song or a teaching that your soul needs to dwell on. Let God lead you there. And then secondly, we don't speak for God that's left open. As we're doing this listening prayer, this discipline of just saying, Lord, let me be quiet before you. Let me listen to you. Listening prayer does not make God speak, and I think that's so important. Instead, it, makes us a, it gives us a focus. Like scripture, reading, or meeting in a small group, consider this another form of concentration. It's giving God an opportunity to speak to us, and under no pressure or under no measure are we filling in the content of that message. Key. We are merely creating a vessel that the Spirit may choose to fill or not. It's a rhythm. We take initiative to place ourselves in a place to receive whatever God has for us, but God himself will take the initiative to speak to us. On my better days, I make time for that. I have time where I have uh, read some scripture and I pray, and there's times, not every time, because I'm, I'm looking at the clock going, oh, I have to get in for a work meeting or whatever. But when I make that time, it's almost 
almost invariably I'm led to a scripture that I just needed to be reminded of. Maybe it was from what I read that day. Sometimes it's just a word of encouragement. And sometimes there's nothing. I just needed to be quiet. And like what I just read, sometimes I'm not going to put words in God's mouth here. I don't know what he has to say to me in a particular day. But part of it's just the discipline saying, I need to hear from you, Lord. I want to listen to you. I need to listen to you. Can I just shut my mouth enough to listen to what your spirit has to say to me? Interesting, Jesus' message is Paul was doing that. He was quieting himself. He was listening. I think that's one of the reasons he was such a powerful apostle is because he practiced that so consistently. But Jesus came to him and said, quick, get out of Dodge. Let's see what Paul's response is. Uh, it's kind of interesting that Jesus would say that, right? I mean, he, he could have said, I'm going to give you power and authority, and you're going to preach that word, and you're going to win over men or converts right there in Jerusalem. He didn't say that. He said, leave quickly. Any why? Because they will not accept your testimony about me. And Paul says, Lord, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who uh, believe in you. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing them, killing him. I think Paul is saying, I'm made for this, for this people at this time. All that background you gave me, studying under Gamaliel, being a Pharisee, you made me God to reach this people group, the Jewish people, the people that I am. You made me for this. Don't tell me to leave. Why would you do that? Keep me here. This is where I need to be. And Jesus says, uh, I Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Isn't that great? Right? Paul, instead of, I mean, he was perfectly prepared to speak and preach to Jews. He was one. He had been trained as one, studied his heart out. He knew Old Testament inside and out. And instead, he's supposed to go and speak to the Gentiles. How about that? Sometimes God has us doing things that don't make any sense, right? Don't make any sense. And yet, that's where God wants us, in part because he wants us radically dependent on him. Right, John? always at all times. And sometimes he takes us way out of our comfort zone because that's, again, where we're going to be clinging to him and not our own gift packages. He loves it when we're going, help, I can't do this on my own. Paul probably would have been very comfortable preaching the Old Testament to Jews, and he had. He had done that. But Jesus' special purpose for him, his calling was, I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles. I think that's pretty cool. So what happens, my question to you is, what happens when God gives you a command or a direction and you're sensing, I'm pretty darn sure this is from God, that doesn't feel very comfortable? Do you resist that? Are you reluctant about it? Say, that couldn't have been me, that must have been the burrito last night. That's no way I could have heard that from God. Or, or do you say, all right. I don't understand why. It doesn't make sense to me. But I will obey you. For those of you who may remember being in a church long ago, there was a song that we used to sing called Trust and Obey. Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's a goodie. Sometimes I wish we could sing some of those old hymns again because there's so much truth to them. Trusting and obeying, submitting to his, his call in our life, and just saying... Okay. Frankly, when, when Cheryl and I were, were in uh, the Philadelphia area, and we had within about a week and a half, two different people call us and say, this was the right place for us to be, Lynchburg from Philadelphia. This was not on our plan. This was not where we were supposed to be. We had other plans, and it involved Philadelphia because we had family there. And oh my goodness, this did not involve Lynchburg, Virginia. Didn't. And yet God made it patently clear through those two calls and then a subsequent series of times that we prayed and prayed and had other people speak into that and it became really clear that we were supposed to leave our home of 32 years and come to Lynchburg, Virginia. It wasn't the plan in our docket. It just wasn't. 
But I'm so glad he did. I am so glad he did. I am so glad he did. And now, some of our family is moving down here, by golly, to be with us. <laughs> and we love having them here because we think this is an awesome place to grow a family and all those great things. And I wouldn't be here in front of you unless God had done some pretty cool things. So what happens? Paul, Paul, after he shares this convincing message of how Jesus rocked his world, he spoke their language, he did all the right thing, and the Jewish people said, yes, no. Their response in verse 22 said, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this, this notion of going to the Gentiles. No, you don't go to the unclean people. You don't spend any time with them. You don't, there's no reason to spend time with Gentiles. They will just soil you. And then they said, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. I mean, that's about his, <laughs> that's not, we don't like him. It's like we hate him. We hate everything there is about him. He ought to be burnt up and gone, right? Rid the earth of him. Have you ever been reviled for your faith? Have you lived so profoundly out of your faith that people have said, and I don't mean unwinsomely, I don't mean being a jerk with your faith, but I mean winsomely living your faith and sharing what God has laid on your heart and still being reviled. That day is coming, folks. If you haven't had it yet, that day is coming. Because whether we like it or not, we are living in a post-Christian world. For those that are, have gone over to Europe and are, are missionaries in Europe, they would say, we are, we are post-Christian, big-time post-Christian. In fact, let me just read to you from a, a book uh, called Positively Irritating, Embracing a Post-Christian World to Form a More Faithful an innovative church, and I think this guy, John Rittner, pastor, was it a pastor, uh, a church uh, in Williamsburg, a very large church, before God called him, talk about rocking his world, to go over to Brussels and serve in Brussels. And he discovered that all his ideas about Christianity and how this played out in the United States, well, how did that play out differently over there? He says, the West has thrown off the shackles of Christendom and its restrictive norms. It has moved beyond Christianity the way modern-day consumers move beyond an old version of a smartphone. People have graded, upgraded to a more effective worldview with advanced features that improve their quality of life, and they are now post-Christian. Citizens of this emerging strand of Western culture have developed a resistance to Christendom's forms of Christianity. They are experienced, they've experienced just enough of the distorted strains of corrupt institutional religion to make them immune to contracting the actual life of Jesus Christ. The attitude toward Christian, Christianity in Europe is basically, we've been there, done there, and uh, done that, and we have the empty cathedrals to prove it. Christianity is passe, and present... Christians are considered quaint and naive for not liberating themselves from an obsolete failed system. The church, as he says in Europe, herself has gone from hero to zero. In America, he says, Christians are no longer seen as a source of good. We are perceived as a force that limits and represses individual expression. In their book, Unchristian, Gabe Lyons and David Kinnaman share their extensive research into the dominant perceptions Americans hold of Christians. Christians are hypocritical. Christians say one thing, but they live something entirely different. Christians are too focused on conversion. Christians are insincere and concerned only with converting others. Christians are anti-homosexual. Christians show contempt for the LB, LGBTQ community. Christians are sheltered. Christians are boring, unintelligent, old-fashioned, and out of touch with reality. This is what survey of thousands and thousands of people here in the United States, not Europe, here, that's the, these are the conclusions. Christians are too political. Christians are primarily motivated by a political agenda to promote right-wing politics. Christians are judgmental. Christians are prideful and quick to find fault in others. That's how we are perceived. Again, not in Europe, but right here in America. And he goes on to say, we need to get ready for this notion that, and I know we're in a bubble here, the Lynchburg bubble, right, impacted by the, by the shadow of, of Liberty University in our backyard. But I think we need to get ready for this notion of living in a post-Christian world. Some of the, I mean, you can't help but look at social media. You can't ha help but turn on the TV. How often do you, is God in any kind of positive way featured? How often does God in any way play an impact in the main character's world? Minimal, right? All doing it on yourself. It's all about how you feel, what makes you, and doing it right. 
just it, it, it's, it's kind, of, kind of messy, isn't it? When's the last time you've been reviled for your faith? And I would suggest to you those days are going to be increasing. But not if we hide. But, 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 if, but only if we hide. <laughs> only if we hide will that be the case. And I don't think there's a place for, for hiding with our faith. Continuing on, Paul's response to his rights. Interestingly enough, Paul um, gets taken by the Roman commander at this point, and uh, um, this is, begins in chapter, uh, verses 22, and uh, so the commander, thinking he's doing the right thing, orders Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked, this man is a Roman citizen. Now, some of you may be wondering, couldn't anybody say that? I'm Roman. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And, and, and the, the reality is, if you claimed you're a Roman citizen back in the day, they could find out and they'd hold you until they found out, and then they'd find out, okay, you're not guilty of just this, you're now guilty of, of, of lying, apparently, and then they would kill you in probably some terrible, awful way. So flogging was apparently better than being killed. The commander went to Paul and asked, and asked him, tell me, you're a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. What I think is interesting about this is how Paul handled that situation. He doesn't claim foul immediately, right? It's, it's only after they were stretching him out that he said, uh, are you sure you want to do this? I'm a Roman citizen. He didn't, he didn't start claiming rights or demanding you know, didn't, didn't assist on those right away. In fact, when you look back at uh, uh, chapter 16, when he's in Philippi, he actually gets flogged, and he's thrown into prison, and he's there in chains praising God because he got to suffer on behalf of Christ's name. It's only afterwards that the, it, uh, the magistrates come out to him and say, wow, uh, are you a Roman citizen? He didn't claim that before. He didn't start waving his Roman citizenship. He was just kind of waiting and seeing what happened. And it makes me wonder what, what we need to do and how we apply that to, uh, to ourselves. Maybe we don't need to demand our rights. Maybe we don't need to demand them. And I, I would suggest that that not only applies to, to us as citizens of a country, but also that applies in our relationships. Whenever I demand my rights in my relationships, it usually doesn't play out well. If I do that in my marriage, it usually doesn't play out well. It doesn't mean I can't share this is what I would like or this would be meaningful to me, but whenever I demand, I can almost guarantee my marriage is going to do this. It just kind of plays out that way. So there, I would wonder what it means for us in terms of not demanding our rights, noticing them, mentioning them, but, but not demanding them. Consideration for us. So what happens after that? So Paul is let go, and, and he, he doesn't get flogged right there. And so the commander says, you know what, this is, a, this is a Jewish matter. Paul, let's have you go and meet with the Jewish officials since, you know, we, you know you're, you're protected from Roman law right now. Let's see what they have to say. So he goes in front of the Sanhedrin. You can read this in chapter 23. And he, he goes in there and he says, guys, my conscience is free. And what Ananias does right away is he says, slap that man. So the guy next to Paul smacks him in the face. And, and, what is Aunt, and Paul says, those who were standing near Paul said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, verse 3, then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Paul knew his law, no doubt. But, uh, but Ananias wasn't too, too pleased with this. 
And, uh, and the folks standing near Paul said, you dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. I, I don't know. But we know that Paul could hedge towards sarcasm, right? There was a number of times when he was writing where he, he kind of poked the bear a little bit. And I half wonder if this is one of those times, and if you read the commentaries, some of them say it was probably sarcasm, you know, it, that, this, that uh, he was saying, Ananias, maybe you're really not the high priest. I know who the high priest is, and it ain't you. Um, but nonetheless, this is just one more example of what Paul's having to go through, getting smacked. He's been uh, uh, accused of all kinds of things. He's already been threatened. I mean, just it's going on and on here, you know, what's happening. And then it doesn't stop there. Um, uh, but, you know, it says that he starts talking about uh, the, the, uh, uh, this dispute. And he talks about this dispute about the hope of the resurrection and the dead. And he knows the Sadducees don't believe in life after death, and the Pharisees do. And all of a sudden, they get into this big... Uh, kerfuffle with each other. That's a fun word, isn't it? Um, and they start actually, it says, pulling him one way into the other. And the Pharisees are saying, no, no, we, we kind of actually we agree with him, that part of what he's saying. And the Sadducees says, no, 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 kill him, kill him, right? And, and the commander gets so concerned, as it says, Paul is going to be ripped to pieces by them, that he actually pulls him away and pushes him into the barracks to protect him. Wow. This has been an eventful couple days for Paul, hasn't it? Life is full of challenges for Paul. Never boring. Never boring. And we're going we're gonna to jump over chapter or verse 11, and then we can come back to, to this. But then what you have here at the end is there's this plot to kill um, Paul, that 40 of these guys... Um, take an oath, and you can read this from chapter or verses 20, or 12 to 35, that, uh, that uh, 40 guys say, we're going to not eat or drink anything until we kill Paul. And they try to get uh, Paul transferred from the barracks over to this other location, and they already have plans that they're going to meet him at that point and probably stick a sword in him and, 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 and off him. Um, and, but his nephew finds out about this, his son of his sister finds out about this, and tells Paul, and Paul does something that I think is interesting. Number one, he says, he doesn't say, don't worry about it, God's got my days numbered, right? Psalm 139, 16, and Job 14, 5 talk about exactly that. God has my days numbered. He doesn't say that, though, even though he trusts God with his days. He tells his nephew to go and talk to the centurion. And in fact, that's what he does. And, and the commander, the centurion, says, by golly, we better do something extra. And they put extra guards around him. And when he's going to be transferred um, up further north to Caesarea, they have like 200 guys around him, easily enough to, to take care of any 40 uh, assassins that might come along the way. And the bottom line is he, he, it all works out. He gets up there safely to Caesarea in life. Uh, continues on for Paul because then he has a trial before Felix and he has a trial before Festus and on and on it goes as he be, has an opportunity to explain his faith in Jesus Christ. He trusted God, but he took action. He trusted God that God has his days numbered, but he took action. Prudent and unafraid. Um, what does that mean for us? So uh, I'm going to focus on that last verse, and this is where we're going to round out our, our sermon this morning. As Paul was sitting there in the barracks um, that night as he was sleeping the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. You see, Paul had an idea really had a dream that he had someday he would go to Rome. But yet, when he came to Jerusalem, remember, his friends were saying, it's not looking good, Paul. Agabus had said, it's not looking good. So in the midst of, in spite of being actively opposed, he took courage. And so again, think about his experience at that point, taking courage when 
you're being threatened of being stoned and flogged. He'd actually experienced all those multiple times. Well, he'd been written off and maligned as a terrorist. We saw that in chapter 21. He was hit in the face just in this, uh, just a little bit before that. He was nearly ripped to pieces by the mob. Acts, uh, active efforts by 40 men to kill him. He knows about that. And Jesus is saying to him, take courage. Take courage right now. Not wait for it. Not wait for it to come to you. Eventually, maybe you'll feel courage. Now wait for the feeling of courage. But he's saying, take courage, Paul. I got things for you. Some of those dreams that you have, I'm, you, I'm going to make them come to pass. Take courage, Paul. I, my plans for you are not done. My purposes for you, my calling on you, still have, have life. And you're going to see what I'm going to do to you. Take courage, Paul. And the interesting thing is that he, at that point, Paul didn't know what was going to happen, right? At that point, consider his insecurities at that point. He was in prison. He was in a location where he was despised. He knew a lot of people wanted to kill him. And they knew his friends said, don't go there. There was a lot of, I mean, we always see the end of the story. But if you put yourself in Paul's shoes at that moment in the barracks, there would have been a lot of reasons to say, uh, courage doesn't make sense right now. Fear does. I should fear a lot. When you're in the moment, when you're in the situation, fear is real big, right? When you don't know what to do, when things are looking really bad uh, in your life at that moment, fear is the predominant feeling, as opposed to saying, in this moment, I will choose courage in God's strength. What does that mean? Paul may have thought his days were done. His ministry was completed at that point. And yet Jesus said to him, I'm sorry, and Jesus said to him, take courage. I'm not done with you. Interestingly enough, we know this now, is that this was about 57, 58 A.D., and Paul had another 10 years of ministry, active ministry, that included much of that in Rome, where he had an opportunity to preach before all kinds of people and win many more souls to Christ. But Jesus says something different. Like I said, I have something more and better. My plans for you, son, are in your future is secure with me. And because Paul understood those things and he had a semblance of an idea of what what Jesus would say to him, he knows knows that taking courage isn't just courage in something that's blind. It's taking courage in the the Savior that holds his life. Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have overcome the world. In Revelation 1, 18, he says that I have overcome death, that hell and Hades, death and Hades are in my hands. In John 14, 2 and 3, he says, I've prepared an eternal for future for you. In fact, I'm going to be preparing the very place where you're going to be hanging out with me, Paul. I got it all figured out. And then right before he ascended into heaven in Matthew 28, 20, he says, Lo, I am with you always, always. In the most difficult, challenging situations where the times where you feel reviled, heartbroken, disappointed, hurt, No matter what your situation, Jesus says, I am with you always. You can know that I'm with you. Taking courage doesn't mean nothing will bad or befall you, right? It doesn't mean that Jesus will spare you painful days or months or years. And the reality is, some people who are believers have died of COVID, right? People, Ron mentioned before, the very, the very nature of Christianity and why it spread so fast is because the level of sacrifice and love that Christians had, be, being compelled by the gospel, put them in harm's way. Many of those people who responded to the pandemic of Black Plague that happened in the Roman Empire died because they served and loved their neighbor. Think about that. They died because they served and loved their neighbor. They weren't triumphant in that moment. And everybody said, wow, you're wonderful, and they got a big medal. They died of the Black Plague, too. Not all of them, but many of them did. But God uses that, right? That powerful example of sacrificial living, of dying is unto Christ, right? To live to Christ and to to die is gain. God uses that powerful example to, to meet people exactly where they're at. So let me tell you about a couple examples of, of, of faithful courage. I, I love the reformers and knowing what it went for them, what it took for them to stand up. Martin, many of you know Martin Luther after he nailed his 95 theses on the, uh, on the door at uh, Wittenberg, right? I think, right? The cathedral there. 
he had, he was called up by the Pope and said, you better, you better uh, tone it down here, buddy, because we're not liking what you're having to say. And so he had to go to the Diet of Worms, and, uh, which was a, a council where they were looking at and seeing what he had to say. And as he's going there, he's knowing, if I don't say the right words, right? My days are going to be very short. And here's what he says. After he goes on for, and if you have an opportunity to read his whole speech, he had to say it first in German, and then they commanded that he do it in Latin. And then he, he says this, I neither can nor will retract anything, for it cannot be either safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. He took courage. He took courage. And he took courage because he knew he had, a, he had a Savior that had overcome death, right? Another example is John Huss. He's not a guy that I've, I've read about, but as I was looking at martyrs, and by the way, if you've never read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, you want to have your heart broken? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who, because of their faith, were executed, were killed in horrendous ways. But they loved Jesus, and they weren't going to stop. Just like Martin Luther, he said, here I stand. This is where I'm at. I stand on Christ, period. If, if, it, if, I, if I die, I die. That's, that's life for me. John Huss was another reformer. He took issue with the current pope in the early 1400s and didn't find anything in the Bible to support indulgences being sold to support crusades to the Holy Lands. He had discovered God's word and held to that and had the actual audacity to speak the truth in the city of Prague where he served as a priest of the largest church. He was thrown into prison for, um, and, when, and when given one last chance to recant before being burned at the stake, he announced, what I taught with my lips, I seal with my blood. And that same day, they put him on a fire, on a uh, on a big bag of on a big bag of uh, of sticks, and they burned him. That's courage, folks. That's courage. Another example is is a certain spouse that I know, um, um, and my one and only spouse. Let's be clear about that. Um, <laughs> sometimes we're called to stand up for our faith when it means life or death, right? And we, I, my mom and dad read to me missionary stories as I was growing up about people that, that gave their life um, uh, as a result of their faith. But sometimes it's just choosing and making, taking courage for those hard calls. Um, Cheryl has said to me for a long time there's a certain role in, in her position um, and her organization that she would never want to take. She sees how it eats up people. She knows what that means. She sees just how, how challenging that position can be and what it would mean if she was ever opted uh, to do that. Well, bottom line is, that position became available recently, and she's going, oh, no. <laughs> and she's looking around saying, I'm not sure there's anybody else here that could do this position. And she was sensing very clearly that God was calling her to step into that role. The very role she said, I would never take, I don't want to do that, that would be just horrendous for me. And God, by his strength, and with Cheryl taking courage, is stepping into that role starting this last week. And God is giving her exactly what she needs, exactly what she needs. That's taking courage. So for some of you, it means stepping back into a relationship that seems really painful and saying, I will try, I will, I will live love that God gives me with this person, in spite of how painful that is. I will choose to pursue is in, in, in whatever way that God calls me to. For other of you, it means pursuing a child, pursuing a family member that is, it's just, it's a painful relationship. And it'd be so much easier to step back and say, there's nothing I can do, oh well, hand them over to, to, to Hades and, and maybe they'll, maybe someday they'll change, as opposed to saying, maybe there's a role that I still have in that relationship and God can use me to do that. That's part of choosing courage, taking courage. I don't know what your particular challenge is. If it's not right now, it will come. It will come soon. And you're going to have an opportunity to take courage. Again, not in your own strength. It's about doing what God has called you to do and, and as being radically dependent on Christ to say, I will do this. 
only because you're doing something in me, right? Jesus was the one who said, I can do nothing apart from the Father. If Jesus, if Jesus could say that twice in John 5, we're toast unless we're doing that fully in his strength, right? But it does mean taking courage, seeing the moment and saying, fear is not going to win the day. Not in my life. Fear will not win the day because I serve a God who has it all, who has me in I, I have, there's no reason to fear. God has me. So, what's a way to wrap this up? Taking courage is utter, utter foolishness unless you have complete trust in the one who directs you, the one who holds you, the one who knows and secures your future. And, and the way that, that I bring this home for myself, when I'm being asked to do something that, frankly, I'd rather not do, um, I have a little poemish sort of thing that I read. And this is what it's called. It's called a tandem bicycle ride with Jesus. And I hope you're touched by this and is an encouragement to you as it has been to me. I used to think of God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there like a sort of a president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I didn't really know him. But later on, when I met Jesus, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike. But it was a tandem bike, and I noticed that Jesus was in the back helping me pedal. I didn't know just when it was he suggested we change, but life has not been the same since, since I took the back seat to Jesus, my Lord. He makes life exciting. When I had control, I thought I knew the way. It was rather boring but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts, cuts up mountains and through rocky places and at breakthrough speeds. It was all I could do to hang on. Do you feel like that? Even though it often looked like madness, he said, pedal. I was worried and anxious and asked, what are you, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer, and I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into adventure. And when, he'd, when I'd say, I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, of acceptance and joy. They gave me their gifts to take on the journey, our journey, my Lord's and mine. And we were off again. He'd say, give the gifts away, they're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did to the people we met, and I found in giving I received, and still our burden was light. I did not trust him at first in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it, but he knows bike secrets, knows how to make it bend to take sharp corners, jump to clear high rocks, fly to shorten scary passages, and I am learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places, and I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful, constant companion, Jesus. And when I'm sure I just can't do it anymore, he just smiles and says, pedal. Now, oh, I hope that's what you're discovering. That you get in the back seat, let the, let the front seat be to Jesus. I don't want to do the country, or the, the country song about Jesus take the wheel. I don't want to go there. <laughs> but I want you to sit, I want you to enjoy the adventure of sitting in the back seat and going, wow. This is scary, but it's so cool because he's got me and he's got the handlebars I don't anymore. And that's where it really gets exciting. And we can live lives full of courage and joy and love because he's doing it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. Oh, you are so good. You hold us. You secure our place. You have done so much for us. You've made it possible for us to be to clear the gulf between us and God. Father, we are thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and for your love for us. We pray, Lord, that we would live courageous lives in this little body called Mosaic Church, that we would encourage and exhort each other to live courageous lives, not sit back, not be held back by, by fear, whatever those situations are, Lord, that you would call us to move out in faith and courage. Lord, pray, I pray that we would do that powerfully in your name, in your strength, Lord, we want to be courageous believers who follow you, who follow your Holy Spirit's leading. Lord, whatever it takes, get us to that point, I pray. 
In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Have a great week, Mosaic. Thanks, Ian.